they loved the open streets. And I was so scared to go into these Zoom <laughs> meetings at first because I figured I got to armor up. I'm going to get an earful. Welcome to the Meatpacking District. Uh, thanks for coming out today. This is our first Treats in the Streets Saturday. So thank you for being here. They just loved it because they didn't have to worry about navigating a busy cafe, right? They walked in the middle of the street instead. Hi, I'm here in the Meatpacking District with Jeffrey LeFrancois, the Executive Director of the Meatpacking Business Improvement yeah, District. Yeah. And we are here to talk about public space management and a lot of the innovative things that are going on in, the, in this neighborhood and the work that Jeffrey is doing so that the whole city and world can learn from his example. <laughs> of which I learned from others too. Yes, right? like yes, this yes, is yes, a, yes. It's an ever-evolving field. We too. are not claiming that he has single-handedly <laughs> developed the, the field of public space management, just that he has integrated many things and expressed them really well. And I will say that the, the thing I give you credit for that I, I think is a first New York, because we've been improving the streets of New York for the last couple of decades. Absolutely. And there's a lot of times you're like, oh, look, a bike lane. You think that's great for New York, but you're always thinking like, well, you know, in Copenhagen, they're not going to be impressed by that. <laughs> you know, oh, look, we pedestrianized the street. That's nice. But like, yeah, we have a ways to go. At the flower show you had this summer, yeah. that was the first thing I've been to that I'm like, Europe has nothing on us. Like you could go to we Paris, did. you'd bring a Parisian there and be, they'd be like, oh, we couldn't execute that. Only New York could. Yeah. Like that was amazing. So and we had that, we had to make sure we had that flash moment. We had to set the bar. So as we go into a new administration, they see what's possible, what can be done. And we have to keep building on top of that bar. And like the way we did that was just, Close Ninth Avenue. <laughs> <laughs> what does it take to make a simple yeah, space like this I function? I mean, give people a space and they, and they will occupy it is really what it comes down to. But for us, um, daily management of tables and chairs. Our umbrellas just went away for the winter season. They, you know, go to storage. And then it's about making sure it's comfortable to pass through and it's also comfortable to spend time having your cup of coffee, having your phone call, having your meeting. I mean, we facilitate that by setting these up and breaking them back down every single night. And the city gave us these plazas as the backbone of what we've been able to build our open streets over and really expand our pedestrian-oriented district because of it. I mean, if you're moving all of this furniture every day, like how many man hours or whatever yeah. for a plaza like this? We have a separate crew that comes in and does setup every morning. Two people doing that, and it's a couple of hours each morning. And then in the evening, depending on the day, we have two to three on crew, but it definitely takes another hour or so to, to break down. Seven or, days a week. So. How big is your team? I'm the executive director of the bid. We've got a director of marketing events and partnerships. We've got a manager for operations and economic development, a digital media and community engagement manager, and a program and event coordinator. So five of us are the core bid staff. And then we have a sanitation team of nine and a landscaping contractor that we use. Um, and as well as a public a pedestrian management team four days a week, they're on the ground doing pedestrian management, and that's a team of five. All together, what, it's like 20 people? Yep. You're from, this is the southern end here? Horatio Street oh, okay. to 17th Street, okay. 8th Avenue to the highway. I mean, so that's a lot of people for not that much space. Yeah. I mean, it's, because yeah. that's the sort of thing I don't think a lot of people realize. They're just like, oh, it's a public space. It almost seems like it, it's so easy, it just happens, kind yep. of. But that's also what I love, right? Because I say, People shouldn't know we exist to a certain extent because mm -hmm. it's just here yeah. to be utilized and to benefit the, the neighborhood. Um, and we went a little further this year because we had the opportunity to take over um, what we call the Ninth Avenue slip lane. And so we've taken this over as a part of the Open Streets program. So here we are on the plaza and then we took over. <laughs> Uh, they did make some 21st century adjustments to the historic road base by a flat um, granite bike lane. Um, it makes a huge difference if you've ever ridden a Oh, yes. I mean, stuff. it's really, when I see this, I think like a very sophisticated design solution. Yep. Like somebody actually thought about biking on cobblestone. Like, look at this. Look. So, the trash corral. <laughs> we ha go through about 55,000 trash bags a year uh, from the bids trash cans. So we're putting trash in the curb lane, not on the sidewalk, and how that works for us and having it service for sanitation. We're standing here on Gansvoort Plaza. I remember when this was just an ugly hunk of asphalt open to cars, and then it's really one of the very early interventions that Jeanette Sadakan did, and they carved out this space, and then just over time, it's been managed better and built out. It's really, it's amazing to see. It was called the Wild West down here for a while because this was literally, it's 90 feet 
curb edge to curb edge across Gansevoort Street here, which is a huge amount of space. Huge yeah, amount of space. For a pedestrian to cross. Correct. Yeah. If you can see, there's so many different designs in the treatment of the cobble because this was actually, this replicates the exact way the cobbles were laid back in the late 1800s when they were first put in here too. Oh. These planters here, these five by 10 boxes are all movable, but they were inspired by the crates of goods that used to fill this, these market streets. This space is great, the neighborhood, but it's also not average in New York. I mean, when you look, this is a special neighborhood. It's sort of isolated. It's a little old, low traffic, the, you know, the historic buildings. I mean, you're just down the street from Jane Jacobs used to live. You have a lot of things going for you. Yeah. What are the lessons for other bids and other parts of town? Like, how do you get started if you're like, hey, I want this for my neighborhood, but I don't quite know what to do? I mean, it's hard, I, but I always say this is what bids should be doing, right? I should be telling my colleagues and neighbors, like, this worked here. Give it a try, see what happens. We are very much a commercial business district and we are so we have residential sort of all around our edges. Mm -hmm. But all the buildings we're surrounded by right now are 100% commercial or hotel. Mm -hmm. um, and so that allows us to experiment differently also. Again, it's the willingness to try too and like knowing that not everybody's gonna be happy <laughs> and that you know, if it's a compromise at the end of the day, that means nobody's gonna be thrilled, right? Everybody's gonna be a little upset because they didn't what they want. So the naysayer, at least they didn't win the day. And they can see that business still benefits, residents still benefit, the visitor still benefits when you don't just maintain streets for vehicles, but you think about them as actual public space. One of the topics I wanted to discuss was community engagement. Because you do all of this, you make it seem seamless. Like I've never heard a, outcry from the community and almost everywhere else in the city they try and do anything there there's a lot of pushback so how do you make it seem so easy i mean there's definitely been pushback there's lengthy discussions <laughs> that go into a lot of this but also it's terrible to say but one of the positives that came out of the pandemic right was was the fast changes that got implemented and were allowed by the city and people saw that the world didn't end right 14th street truck and transit priority way the world didn't end when that went into effect. And because open streets happened the way that they did, and we planted a very early flag on them, people realized, oh, this is possible. A key factor for us is also like time of day treatment. We have the ability to manage the streets so that it meets the needs of the district, right? Like wholesale goods, commerce needs to move in the morning. The HVAC guys, the plumbers have to come service buildings. So the streets do need to be open. And then afternoon time comes and pedestrian, shopper, lunch, museum traffic picks up and so that's when our our open streets really go into effect and really benefit the visitor in the neighborhood but you're there talking to the businesses absolutely the community so, board the residents yeah. is there an official process or are you just out there talking to we're people just, all we the just talk we just talk a lot um and right like my key is to make sure i if i have objection that we are listening to it and understanding why and maybe there's a tweak that we need to do but this was also a major factor of like that let's try it, see what works, and fix what doesn't, but keep going, right? Don't tell me to do it and then just tell me to take it all away. Uh, well, we did last year was Little West 12th Street, which is right behind us, uh, which is one of our favorite streets. It's just a two block little petite street in the meatpacking district, because it shows what's possible um, when it's not just about parking and moving vehicles, that you can make a, a, a valuable public asset by thinking about pedestrians. You start with temporary experiments, you do something for a weekend, people see it. That seems to be exactly. part of the real secret to yeah. the, your formula. And I mean, the, one, the biggest thing we did, you know, last year with our Future Street installation, which we just did this past weekend, we put down 5,000 square feet of sod. And I got emails of people volunteering to water the grass. <laughs> I got like a, this outpouring and then I got yelled at because we took it away. <laughs> the op usually you get yelled at for doing something different, right? And not for bringing back the status quo. So that was a real, again, it's, it's getting people to see what's possible. And when you take it away, they remember that they yearn for it. So like, then what can we do to, to actually bring it back and have it be successful? And we saw that when we presented our permanent open streets plan to the community board, because some of them were going so far as to say, well, maybe we should just go as all the way to Hudson, right? They were actually considering pushing the bounds of what we were proposing to do also. Just to get folks to start thinking about it is, is a success in and of itself. And, and but parking management is part parking of Parking management's job. a factor. Um, I mean, again, streetscape is ours. So we have a sanitation team, landscaping, 
Um, and like you said, public space management. So like, I'm advocating for specific open streets parking as well. I want signage that says oh. open streets hours, no parking between because. Oh, um, okay. What we now have in the city is a formula that in some business areas where there, is, there, where there are well-functioning bids, public space management, the city's kind of figuring it out. Yes, and it's again, it's something that bids which we're sort of micro city managers, right? We might we manage our little districts. We have the ability to experiment more than the city does. So the city should look to us for what works, what doesn't, and then export that management to places where there isn't a bid or where the neighborhood needs more re resources from the city itself to make something successful. And do you have thoughts on how this model could translate to residential areas? Because you need public space management in residential areas, and I can hardly think of a place where that really happens. I really don't, but the city needs to figure that out because all the residents want bid services, but none of them want to pay for it. And like, I can understand that because we all pay taxes. Mm -hmm. um, and in an ideal world, bids shouldn't exist because the city should be able to provide the services the demands of every neighborhood, mm -hmm. but it doesn't work that way. So how can the city do better? Um, I think, again, it's a willingness to actually experiment.